Super. All right. Uh, good evening and welcome everyone uh, to our COVID-19 seminar webinar for uh, freelancers and independent contractors. I'm New York City Council Member Brad Lander. Thrilled to be co-hosting this with Manhattan Borough President Gail Brewer. Um, long time, you know, fighter for New Yorkers in general, but especially you know, seeing freelancers and independent contractors is an important part of the city uh, for a long time now. Um, we've got a great lineup tonight. Uh, quite a few of you were with us uh, a few weeks back when we did uh, a webinar for freelancers in the really very early days, just as the pandemic unemployment assistance had been passed and it was clear at least that freelancers and independent contractors would be able to apply. And Nicole Salk, who's from Legal Services NYC, uh, did a great presentation. I know a lot of you have followed it, but a lot of you have hit the frustrations of pending status and challenging application. Um, and after that uh, event, which also featured Yuli New and some of our state legislators talking about issues uh, around housing, uh, we sent out a survey uh, to uh, find out a little more about about what life was like for artists and graphic designers and writers and freelancers. Um, and the results were really overwhelming. And I think uh, Naomi is going to screen share them. Uh, this will not surprise any of you. But, um, you know, what we got back um, was this. 88% uh, uh, of the freelancers who replied had lost more than 50% of your income. 84% applying for unemployment assistance, and we'll hear in a minute that the fact that that has been so slow uh, is obviously devastating for people without income. 62% worried about paying rent with all the implications that, that that would have. So really scary numbers. I know not surprising to you, but I think it's, you know, the toll that this is taking across all kinds of communities. You know, we just finished cheering for the set of essential workers, but art is essential work and writing is essential work and um and it's not happening right now and the income loss from that is really devastating so we wanted to come back thank you naomi uh we wanted to come back a couple of weeks later we promised that we would and provide a little more information so um what we're going to do tonight is the following after i'm done uh the borough president will say hello and then we have three great presenters um Nicole Salk, who uh, was from last time, is back with us uh, again, and she's going to give us a follow-up on where things stand uh, and some tips for how to get through that unemployment assistance application. Uh, Rob Pichota from the Federal Small Business Administration is going to talk about small business loans and grants for independent contractors and sole proprietors and uh, take some questions. And then third, Jivya Sundaram from Community Voices Heard is going to talk about housing issues. Um, before I turn it over to uh, the borough president, I know that some of you uh, are on out of concern uh, about the, the bill that I've introduced in the city council to provide paid sick leave to gig workers and out of concern that that would interfere with or do harm to genuine freelancers. And I promised you, and I'm gonna live up to my promise, that tonight we're gonna share some new language for that bill that really very clearly exempts anyone engaged in professional services um, it's a long list. I'm going to wait to share that till the end, but that's not because I'm trying to sneak it past you. We just have these three great presenters that you asked for, and I really want you to hear from them. We're going to make two different times next week to talk about the new language. So we're going to share that language at the end of this call. I'll give you the new language of the bill, and then we'll make two times next week to come back and really drill down on it together. And I promise we won't move forward with it till we've had good time to work together and address your concerns. I know these are anxious times, and the goal is to do things that help people, not to do things that, uh, that cause people any agita. So thank you. Um, all right, uh, we are so lucky, and you may remember that in some time, some ways last time, uh, we were, uh, this was kicked off by David Siffert from Village Independent Democrats and Mia Perlman. Um, and uh, they are great allies, and we had a big long lineup, but we talked about who we needed to co-sponsor this one with to get the widest reach to the people who really needed to hear about this. Um, and obviously there's a lot of freelancers and independent contractors and artists in Brooklyn, but a whole, whole lot in Manhattan, and so we're really lucky to have with us just the tireless um, and really insightful into so many of the challenges of governing in and out of crises, Manhattan Borough President Gail Brewer. 
Well, thank you very much, Brad Lander. Oh, I'm, I'm on. Yep, I'm on. And um, this is a really, really important topic. And I think I remember uh, many years working with you on topics, including paid sick days, but you have always been a champion. In Manhattan, we have been focused on a couple of things. Uh, what happened at sort of, I don't know, three weeks ago or so when we heard about the city money for small businesses and nonprofits, and then about the federal money is we have a really, as you do, but a very every single day newsletter. And it's very popular, our newsletter. And so we put in it, contact Professor Tim Wu, whom you know, um, at Columbia University. And long story short, he had 50 students and they focused on applications when it looked like third, fourth stimulus, nowhere was anybody getting money, Chase was being impossible, and the big banks were being horrible. So to the credit of the 50 students, they just worked with every single, my goodness, do we get swamped when we put it into the newsletter. And a lot of people who came through us and we passed them on to Columbia Law and Columbia Business were gig workers. They were one person who hadn't been able to get through the process. So I have gotten quite a few emails today, ironically, stating that people got money. That doesn't mean that gazillions uh, did, but I, I do want to say thank you to those folks. And I know Manhattan Chamber of Commerce and PACE are doing the same. And then we've been working with the even harder group, which are artists from Harlem and in Washington Heights. And these are sometimes, you know, individuals or very, very small nonprofits. And them getting through is even more difficult. So we're trying to get them some money through the philanthropy. But all of them are small business people. If you are an artist, you are a graphic artist, as you indicated, that's who is in uh, the phone calls that we do every week uh, through uh, Boza Rivers and the Harlem Artists Alliance and others are individuals who are business people and who are trying to survive. And I'm sure they fit into that statistic that you showed earlier of losing their business and not being able to pay rent. We're lucky that the governor, I think August 20th is the new date when rent will be due, or no, when the moratorium is over and then rent is due. So we still have that same problem. So um, I think in New York City, I'm sure we'll hear from your amazing speakers that one in three New Yorkers engage in freelance work. And I would guess that in uh, Manhattan, it might be even higher. And the reason you know that is that I think it's gonna get higher after this god awful virus is over. Now, today's times are full of papers about commercial enterprises saying, oh, you can stay home. I don't have to pay for the you know, commercial footage that I would have to pay if you came into the office, et cetera. But I just think there might be even more and more people looking for work. So it's 1.3 million approximately in New York City earning 31.4 billion every single year. And um, it's a lot. So it's, it's definitely uh, part of our economy. And of course, it might be the group of people that's hurt even more. Now, of course, the third or fourth, I guess, included uh, smaller banks, what we call the CFIs, the smaller co-ops, in terms of small banks and the cooperatives where there would be more support if you attached yourself to that institution when you're applying for money. And Chase was a little bit better, as I understand it, talking to the uh, folks at the small business services in the city of New York. But there's still a big uh, challenge. There are so many uh, lessons learned from this uh, horrible experience, and one of them is the banking industry, and certainly has been very enlightening. When we're on the phone with the Harlem institutions, Carver Bank looks really fabulous because they have taken the individuals, gone person by person, and they have a very high success rate in terms of getting money from SBA. Um, so we all have had contacts canceled as a freelancer. It's hard to find new clients. It's hard to uh, figure out how to take care of the kids and do your work at your home. Um, we all know the food and the housing problems and we know how hard it is to get work. So I can say that this call is a great step in the right direction. You have the best people uh, giving assistance. And I hope that in the next um, round, which I assume there will be, there'll be rounds of cares that we'll hear about more from your uh, federal speaker, 
but you know we hope that there'll be some changes even more supporters of CFIs the smaller banks and also um, my understanding is it might even be focused on even smaller individual institutions meaning uh, people who are in the gig world would have a better chance maybe even going down to 20 employees or less as a focus so I'm here to say um, I remember meeting with the freelancers or maybe a year or so or more and um, I think the City Council thanks to you and others has done a lot of work for them because whether you were a model um, or you were um, any other kind of graphic artist, when you're trying to get paid, it was a very challenging situation. And as a model, uh, we had about 10 models at this particular uh, meeting and uh, between the harassment and the challenge of getting paid, it was a very uh, unfortunate circumstance. And the city council has done a lot to try to address those issues. But to have this on top of it is very, very hard. So um, I'm honored to be here. I look forward to the discussion. And I know that this is a group. It is interesting to me that when I asked about the third and the fourth and now the fifth, I think actually uh, that the unions played a big role, particularly in getting uh, the PPP to include gig workers because of Broadway. Uh, the Broadway individuals, union or not, often are gig workers. And that is a group of individuals who had lobbied very, very uh, uh, strongly to be included in the federal money and I understand from union leaders that they took that under advisement and uh, probably have more Republican contacts than you and I might mm -hmm. and they were able to uh, get the gig worker into uh, the PPP now that doesn't mean that everybody got money but at least it's an opening and we hope that it will continue thank you very very much thanks so much Gil and there's a question for you from the Q&A just if people want to get on your newsletter uh, how do they do that? They just go to Manhattan BP, like borough president, dot NYC, dot gov slash sign up. Thank you, Gail. And the legislation that the borough president was referring to is the Freelancers and Free Act, which makes sure you can get paid on time and in full. We covered that on the last call, so we're not going to cover it in this one, but you can, it, there's a lot of good information there that's available on our website and the Department of Consumer and Worker Protection. And um, Gail, on the last call, another thing that really happened that was very powerful, Yulene New was, uh, was on the call, whose husband is himself a freelancer, and so their income has dropped off dramatically, and I think she really channeled the anxiety and just kind of terror that people are feeling right now. And So um, we're just doing our best to make sure that everyone has all the access they can. And both of the things, so a lot of you have found the question and answer. Uh, that is great, and we're going to answer as many of those questions as we can, but with 250 of you, uh, we're going to get started now. I think on the two programs most of you are asking about, how do I get through this very difficult pandemic unemployment assistance if I'm uh, a gig worker, and how do I deal with all these challenges, and what about the PPP, and how does that work for sole proprietors? We have the perfect people to address this, give you some information, and answer questions, and so we're going to turn to them now. Um, first to Nicole Salk uh, from Legal Services, who a lot of you will have heard from last time. Uh, she's got a lot of many weeks now of hearing from people what is not working about that system and at least some tips on how to wrestle your way through it. Nicole, thanks so much. I know that you're not just doing webinars, you're doing an amazing amount of work to try to help everybody, whether they're freelancers, whether they're employees, to navigate through this system. And, and we really, really appreciate your being here. So hi everybody and um, thank you Brad and Gail, you guys, I really appreciate all the work that you have done for so many years for workers' rights and your stalwarts for us in the city and we, we really, really appreciate that. As someone who does workers' rights advocacy, um, we really um, are so appreciative of the work that you do. Um, I have a choice today. I can go and share my screen and go through some of the stuff that we talked about last time. I could spend, you know, maybe 10 minutes reviewing um, what we did, um, or I could just go straight to questions and answers if folks want to do that. So I'm not sure what makes sense for you guys. Um, I can get started, and if you want to go to questions and answers, happy to break off and to try to do whatever I can. I know there were some questions um, initially that were sent to me about 
Um, you know, just the standard questions like how long do I have to wait? And there's some stuff about partial unemployment, which I'm happy to answer and we'll go through it in my standard presentation. So um, I'll just get started on, on sharing my screen. This is going to be a little bit of a repeat for some folks, um, but it will be, I think, hopefully some of the information will have more relevance now that a lot of folks have applied and to the extent that people, um, you know, um, haven't applied, hopefully this will, this will be helpful to you. So I'm just gonna go really quickly, very, very quickly over some standard um, information that a lot of folks may have some familiarity at this point with, but just again, to go through it really quickly. Um, of course, uh, you know, there's New York State Unemployment Insurance. And as I mentioned in the original call that we did several weeks ago, um, a lot of folks actually have mixed income and so you may be eligible for state unemployment insurance. And frankly, at this point now, the application includes both questions. It's one application now, the new application. There's been about four of them, I think, at least. Um, there probably have been more that it's changed so often, and which I don't think actually has been a great service to um, folks who've been applying. I think it's been very, very confusing. And I think, uh, but it is the reality that we have with the State Department of Labor. So there's New York State regular unemployment insurance. There now um, is also something called pandemic emergency unemployment insurance. And this does a few things. It increases the amount of weeks that people are eligible for. So standard uh, amount of weeks are 26 weeks, both for regular unemployment, if you qualify for that, or if you end up qualifying for uh, what I'll talk about a little bit later, which is the pandemic unemployment assistance which uh, many, many freelancers and self-employed folks who have only that exclusively will qualify for just that. And I know that most people have not gotten that yet. That is true. Most people have not gotten pandemic unemployment assistance, even though many, many people have applied for it. Very few people have actually gotten it. Um, the Pandemic Emergency Unemployment Insurance, PEUC, is giving another amount of time, uh, additional 13 weeks for folks to collect unemployment. So it's up to 39 weeks. Um, and pandemic unemployment assistance um, basically um, is allowing folks who had not traditionally been eligible for unemployment, either because they're independent contractors or self-employed, um, or for whatever reason, they, didn't, they weren't able to uh, qualify for regular state unemployment. For example, they didn't receive enough uh, earnings during their, their benefit year. Um, there is now a, a merged application, as, and I will spend maybe just a little bit of time going through that and some of the uh, pitfalls that people can get into because the, the application is really difficult. But I have a copy of some of the screenshots which I can share for folks and even probably put it on the... Um, chat so folks can get the link and look at it. Um, in order to be eligible for unemployment, uh, standard unemployment, um, you have to be monetarily eligible for benefits. That's not true for PUA. Um, you must have lost your job through no fault of your own, not necessarily true for the pandemic unemployment assistance. Um, and you must be capable, available, and looking for work. And generally that is true both for regular unemployment and for pandemic unemployment with some very important exceptions, which I'll talk about a little bit later. Um, typically, monetary eligibility, eligibility for regular unemployment is about half of what your earnings were, your normal weekly earnings. So if you earned $800, you would get about $400 in unemployment with the maximum amount of being, of being 504. Um, this is also probably gonna be true with pandemic um, unemployment. Uh, generally, they're looking at net earnings as opposed to regular unemployment where they're looking at your gross earnings. So there's some advantages for folks who um, collect, generally an advantage for folks who collect regular unemployment uh, with some exceptions, which I'll also talk about later. Um, but the maximum benefit either for uh, regular unemployment or for pandemic unemployment will be no more than 504. Um, there will be a $600 add-on that goes from benefits uh, for people who certify from April 5th through the end of July who, who continue to be unemployed for four months. Those folks will get an additional $600. So the max that you can get for regular unemployment and for pandemic unemployment is $1,104. That's the max. Now the one uh, difference is with 
regular unemployment, the minimum is actually lower. Um, it's like 104 than what it is for pandemic unemployment, which is 182. And I know that those who have gotten pandemic unemployment, I have not a single client who's gotten it yet, but I've seen um, on the website that um, those folks, uh, a lot of folks are getting the minimum. And I'm going to talk about if you have gotten the min minimum, how you can appeal to get a higher amount. So stay tuned for that. Um, also with regular unemployment, something to be aware of because folks, many of the folks on the call may have mixed income. They may have gotten regular unemployment at a very low rate. Um, they may be able to increase that rate by asking for something called the alternate base period. When you get, when you apply for unemployment, you will get in the mail a monetary benefit determination. Usually that comes within a week. We are seeing now that people are not getting it for many, many weeks, three to four weeks, sometimes a little bit longer. But when you get that, you have 10 days to request the alternate base, which is really switching your quarters of earnings to the most recent period. Um, and if you have earned more in the most recent period, um, you may be eligible to get a higher rate. Um, a lot of questions um, I know are coming in, especially from freelancers, about partial unemployment. This, these rules will be the same for whether you qualify for state unemployment, New York State unemployment, or for the pandemic unemployment assistant, PUA. Um, basically, it is a terrible system in New York, and I, I hate to tell people this because they get so discouraged, um, but um, there has been for a long time actually um, many bills for years and years and years in the state legislature that have not gone anywhere to change the system, but this current system in New York is that any work on any given day counts as a day of work. And you cannot work more than three days out of the week. Um, if you work four more days, you will not be able to collect any unemployment, any pandemic unemployment assistance, and you will not get that $600. Uh, so it's a, it's a really bad system that we have in New York State. Um, I can't say more about it. It's just terrible and it, you know, you can do with, do the, with that information what you like to do with that information. So, um, Nicole, let me just, I'm yeah. gonna, so, uh, for freelancers, if, if they concentrate the work they're doing in three days of the week, they're eligible, assuming they other, you know, lost income and or would otherwise be eligible. But if they would spread the same amount of work out over four days, then they're, they're not, not eligible. eligible for pandemic unemployment. Yes, that is a terrible, Yes to that. All right, but an important um, thing for people to- Yeah, so if there's any way for folks to move their work into less than four days, I would, I would if there's any way that you could do it, you should do it uh, because then you'll be eligible for at least a quarter. So it, how it works is for every day that you work, you lo lose a quarter of your benefit. So if you had a $400 benefit rate, you would lose $100. If you, if for one day, for two days, you'd lose 200. For three days, you'd lose 300. But you would still get the additional $600, at least for until July 31st. Um, so yeah, it, this is true for regular unemployment as well as for um, pandemic unemployment. Um, and uh, let me just quickly move now to the pandemic unemployment assistance kind of want because I want to make sure we have time for everything that I want to show you in the updates. Um, so, um, as many folks know who've applied for it, there's now a merged application. Originally, when people applied for, for, uh, for this, they applied using the old standard uh, state unemployment application. And for those folks who applied under the old system, they should have gotten, if they didn't yet apply for a pandemic because they were told to wait till they were denied, which now is no longer the case. I mean, the problem is, is that, and I really, really feel so bad for folks, is that we've gotten so many different pieces of information from the Department of Labor or no information. The communication has been really bad, um, both from the website. In fact, the most updated information, to the extent that we can trust it, is coming from the New York State uh, Department of Labor's Twitter site. That seems to be the most up-to-date information, so I would check that. Um, but at any rate, um, folks who applied for pandemic unemployment originally should have gotten something through their New York State government ID secured message. So most people have to create that. If they're, if they're applying online, they would create 
a New York State government ID, there are messages on there. So you should check that if you can get on and check your secured messages. You can also send messages through that. They uh, don't seem to be answering them right now, but you can send messages. And if there's any issues, such as, for example, you're not able to certify, which we are hearing from so many people that they haven't been able to certify for whatever glitchy reason, um, that you should definitely send a secured message. There's specific subject lines that allow you to back certify through that by just sending emails, basically. So it's it isn't going to register in the system, but it does create a record, which I really encourage as a lawyer, I encourage people to always create written records of the things that they're trying to correct with the Department of Labor. Um, so, so folks who haven't yet applied for unemployment, pandemic unemployment assistance, which is now this one, it's now this one application, they ask you lots of different questions. Um, they, uh, folks who are um, independent contractors or have insufficient work histories or self-employed may be eligible for pandemic unemployment. It is gonna be, um, it, it will be backdated as, as well as state unemployment will be backdated to the time um, that you've uh, lost your work, I think from beginning of, from the end of February, from the beginning of March. The $600 add-on starts April 5th. Um, so folks who eventually get all of this stuff straightened out, and I know many people on this call um, have not received anything yet, eventually you should receive all of that. And I'm going to also put on my on the chat information about how to reach us at Legal Services. Um, we are getting a ton of calls, so I can't promise that um, everyone's going to get through to be able to get an appointment on the phone, but I'll, we still have some, occasionally do have some capacity and try to answer people's calls. We cannot really answer calls about, you know, I'm still pending, what do I do to get to, through the Department of Labor? Because we don't even know how to answer that, unfortunately. What we can answer questions about is, I've been denied, what do I do, how do I appeal? Um, am I, you know, I have this particular issue that's causing a problem, I made a mistake on the application, what do I do? Those kinds of questions, about that where it's not like I'm waiting and I don't can't get through because there's you know we may be able to uh, have you talk to somebody uh, in our offices um, who, who may be able to answer some of those questions. Nicole, um, I've got a question from some people that we've gotten a number of times because you mentioned the new merged application mm -hmm. uh, from some folks who applied before the applications were merged and are now getting a little bit of UI because they only had a little bit of W-2 income. They mostly wow. had freelance income. Um, can they, how do they apply under the, can they still apply under the PUA for the income that they deserve? Okay, I'm gonna go right to the screen that I have just for that. Um, so there are, I wanna talk about something called a monetary benefit determination, I mentioned it. They probably got a monetary benefit determination in the mail, and it probably showed that they got a very little bit of amount, amount of, um, of uh, unemployment because they did have mixed income. So for those folks, they may be stuck with that low amount, which is terrible, or, or if they have employers during the course of their standard base period or their alternate base period, employers that may have misclassified them. So the standard, the standard example that I would give is folks who are um, Uber drivers or app-based delivery drivers or app-based app cleaners like uh, handy cleaners or folks who may be um, working uh, you know, for a family, domestic workers who may have been misclassified by their employer. Um, in other words, they were not paid, they may have gotten 1099 income or were paid under the table. Um, those folks should definitely contact us for more information, but I also want to just make folks aware that there is a reconsideration process. And they can, this form, which I'm showing on the screen at the very bottom, it's a one page form. I don't know if I can click on it and go, go to where, what it looks like. This is it. Um, it's a one page form. If you believe that there are employers during your, your base or alternate base period that may have misclassified you, in other words, they paid you under the table or paid you 1099 and they should not have because you may have really been an employee. And that's not always an easy determination, which is why if you have any questions, I would ask you to give us a call. 
but this is the form that you use to get those wages that you may have received as 1099 improperly. Sometimes it's proper. Sometimes you're an actual independent contractor. Those determinations are often difficult to figure out. But if it's really clear that you should have been paid as a W-2 and you weren't, the Department of Labor allows you to use this process, which you have to fax or send, but we also encourage folks, if they can upload this to the Department of Labor through that secured messaging, um, to do that as well. And to put in any kind of documentation, if you don't have it, you don't have it, but if there's any documentation you have of the income that you received, which was misclassified, should have been paid to you as a W-2, but wasn't, um, and, I, and you can use anything. You can use your affidavit. You can just you can say that this, you received it in cash. You, if you have bank statements of checks that went to your bank, you can use that. We do that with Uber, Lyft, and Via drivers. Um, we show bank statements. We show earnings statements. Um, you can upload all of that and by secured messaging. But we also they they require it to be faxed or mailed. So we ask that you do that as well. Um, there is a way to fax things from your computer, we do it. Not everybody has that capacity, but if you need some help, uh, we may be able to help you with that. Uh, so that's something I just wanna make people aware of. And I'm gonna go back to the last screen. Um, so um, there's the reconsideration issue. Um, and also the issue that comes up a lot with um, pandemic unemployment assistance um, is that Folks may be working now, but may have, or maybe not have been working, but are, are about to lose um, work that they, that they counted on. So they had been given an offer of employment or for, for freelancers, maybe there was some kind of assignment that you were given that has now been canceled. Um, you can apply based on the future work, based on that work. You can apply at the time that you were supposed to have had it. So if it was supposed to start, um, you know, May 1st, you can apply now. And um, it's not, this is not something I think that the Department of Labor has really wrapped their head around. Um, so this may be something that needs to be straightened out later, unfortunately, I hate to say it. But if you are um, wanting to get access to benefits, and if, you know, if you're willing to slog through this a little bit, I do think people will be able to be able to prove um, that they should be eligible for pandemic. And I also want to say that this is true for college students and this is true for high school students. Um, and we're going to be putting together some kind of flyer that talks about that. Folks who've lost summer jobs, even though they may have not had a job before, but you know, really were counting on something and it got canceled. Um, you may be eligible or your, your kids may be eligible for uh, pandemic unemployment assistance. So stay tuned for that because we're gonna try to give more information about that um, as soon as we were just hearing last week that there's a possibility of that and we're really excited to be able to share that because any income coming into a household is important income. Um, so I just, I know that the question that we get more than anything is how do we reach the Department of Labor? Um, I spoke to a Department of Labor rep but have, have not been approved. When will I get approved? and I'm trying to certify, but the system won't let me, what should I do? Um, I really, I really wish, I, I, I really wish I could answer these questions. What I will say is that we saw today on Twitter that the Department of Labor is going to, I think be issuing, uh, is going to be sending out uh, messages through their secured message to anybody who hasn't been certifying. I'll believe it when I see it, but that's what they're telling us they're gonna do. So please, please, please check your secured messages on your New York State government ID. Please check them frequently. Um, I will also say that obviously speaking to a Department of Labor rep um, is not a panacea. People have spoken to folks and they've still been kept in pending status. But if you are someone who has been in pending status for a really long time or you never spoke to a rep, I do encourage you, I hate to say this, Brad, to reach out to your electeds. <laughs> but your electeds, um, mostly, go ahead. Well, I'll just add here, state level electeds, and I'm delighted always to take help, to help my constituents in Brooklyn as much as we possibly can. But I will say that our state electeds, both the assembly members and the state senators, have been given some ability 
to elevate cases and get attention to them. Yes. yes. So, Brad, I want to second that because in Manhattan, obviously, we're all on these calls constantly. And every state rep in Manhattan, and I'm sure it's true elsewhere, has a person assigned to do one thing, which is to deal with unemployment. Now, they're not going to be, nobody is going to be, Nicole, nobody in the whole world is going to be you, Nicole. But it just in terms of where am I, that they can answer. And I also, we're getting a lot of calls, and we have a person, I won't even give his name, but we have a person that we are focused on. And I also know something else very interesting that gives people some hope, which is that the second floor, so-called, has about a thousand people in the state of New York who work for the governor and everybody uh, around the state has been told, you know, you need to spend X number of hours calling people. So there's a lot of effort uh, going on to reach out but i do agree that uh, your state electeds can tell you where you are in the process what they can't do is what nico when you run into a really snaggy difficult situation um i don't know that that can get answered but where am i when am i going to get my money you might get i think the state folks can help you and steph has just dropped the you know find your rep link in the in the chat box to help you find your state senator or assembly member if you don't know who they are so um, before I get to the application, and please cut me off if I'm taking too long, um, I just want to make people aware of a couple of things. First of all, this is really important to certify. So if you can certify, please do so. Um, no matter what, even if you've been denied PUA or you've been denied state unemployment, please try to continue to certify if you can. And if you have any issues certifying, please try to go on your New York State government ID and document your problems, whatever they are. Um, so that is another tip I would say. Um, if you've been denied unemployment, like actually denied it, you've gotten a decision where you've been denied it, or you've been denied PUA, I've been told you're ineligible, um, you may be eligible to reapply, um, especially for the PUA, because I know a lot of people are making mistakes on PUA. Um, I would encourage you to, pro I, I, in, in the past, the Department of Labor was saying don't reapply, but I say people probably should. <laughs> Um, because we're getting so many mixed messages. I don't think it hurts to reapply. If you, um, if you have not heard anything on your unemployment application, I mean, like you're not in pending status and you can't certify, um, maybe what you should do is reapply. If you're in pat pending status and you're able to certify, I wouldn't reapply. Um, if you've been denied and been told you are not eligible for PUA, you may want to reapply if you think you made a mistake. The other thing I think it's really important, especially if you've been denied, um, clearly denied unemployment or been told you're ineligible for pandemic, um, is that you should ask for a hearing. You have 30 days, 30 days to request a hearing. And I've put on here, there's information on the Department of Labor, Labor about how to do it. You can ask for a hearing online. Um, you can also request, or, uh, request it by mail or fax it. Um, you don't need to say much, um, but you do need to say you disagree with the decision. You need to say who you are, and you should give at least your last, the last four of your social security. Um, and you need to say you disagree with the decision. Um, I'm going to go through a little bit on the application. And let's, uh, we, I want to get to Rob before too long. So yeah, OK. So maybe I won't go through the application. I can just upload it. Um, I know we got some questions about PPP and CUA and EIDL. I am not an expert in this field. Maybe Rob can help answer these better. What I have been told is that, um, or what I understand is while you can technically apply for both PPP and, and PUA, PUA, you may have to report the income received from PPP, which um, when you're doing uh, your weekly certifications for unemployment, which may make you ineligible for PUA. Um, this is not definitive, but this is what, because um, we've not been give, given specific guidance on this, um, but this is the understanding for those who, who, who've been doing more of the PPP work. They're, they're concerned about those two things. Um, however, if you get PPP funds, you may want to apply for, for PUA when the PPP funds run out. Um, so I just wanted to put that information. I am not a PPP expert, so I unfortunately can't answer a lot of questions about that. A couple of things on the application before I go, which is that... Um, one of the questions on the application is, can you telework? And people are making all kinds of mistakes about that. 
what that means when they ask you, can you telework? It doesn't mean, can you telework? It means, have you been offered work from home? And have you essentially denied, you know, said, no, I'm not, I'm not going to do it. it. It's not, it's a very trick question and a lot of people are messing it up. So if you're asked, can you telework? Can you work from home on the application? You should only say yes if you've actually been offered that work to do and you've been offered it at the same amount of money or with the same hours that you had been doing it before. That is a trick question that people are getting. Um, there also is another trick question about availability because generally you want to say, if at all possible, that you are available for work. And of course, some people who are eligible for PUA are folks who have kids who are home, you know, where school is closed and they are not really available for work because they have to take care of their kids. Those, ki those people are eligible for pandemic unemployment. They are eligible for pandemic unemployment. So when they ask you about availability, they mean anything other than the reason than COVID-19. So if COVID-19 closed the schools, then, then you're not available for that reason. But, but for that reason, are you available? You should say, yes, you are available. Those are the two really trick questions. There's a bunch of other problems with the application, which I won't go into so that we have time for the rest of the presentation. That's great, Nicole. Thank you so much. And can you, there's a lot of questions for you. So can you stick around and we'll take them after Robert's presentation? Sure. All right. Thank you. Uh, some of them kind of are about this intersection between PUA or UI and, and PPP or IDLE. So, um, uh, okay. Uh, Robert, thank you so much for being here. Lots of questions as well about PPP and IDLE uh, as they relate to sole proprietors and independent contractors. So we're grateful to have you here to help address them. Well, it's my pleasure. Thanks for having me. It's a, it's a hot topic, and uh, I certainly am empathetic to everyone out there. Uh, a little bit about me. I was the Small Business Development Center director in the Brooklyn office for a number of years, so I'm very familiar with uh, the city and Brooklyn in particular, but especially some of the types of businesses you are all in. So let me do a little bit of context real quick, sort of explain where we have been, where we're going, uh, and it's a moving target. There are literally changes coming out like every other day, the modifications based on your input to your elected officials. So uh, your, your voice and is being heard, voice is. So first of all, the idle, uh, economic injury disaster loan. We love acronyms, idle. So that is the, if you have an application in, and you haven't got your advance yet, or you haven't got the actual loan yet, um, it's, um, it's coming, uh, it's, it's in process. If you have a number, it's in process. If you have not applied for idle, they are not accepting new idle applications. Again, the idle is designed to help you pay for things like accounts payable, uh, other, other types of bills that are not being paid because of the drop off in your revenue. You can pay for rent uh, expenditures. So that kind of thing, the idle it can be used for. There was an opportunity where you could check off for an advance for your idle. If you got an advance, or if you think you're getting an advance, I saw the note earlier on, and because there's such a wealth of uh, hits on this program, there's over 5 million applications. Uh, nobody expected that. Uh, now we're recognizing, whoa, and of course, the, our elected officials done the best they could to prepare for it, but clearly uh, it, it remains to be seen if more things will be done. But right now, the idle advance, it came to about $1,000 per employee. So not about, but $1,000, exactly. So if you receive out of the blue $1,000 in your account, and then maybe an email a, a day or two later, or haven't got it yet, that and it has SBA somewhere in the title of that deposit, that was your idle advance. That is, in essence, a grant. You don't pay that back. You use that for uh, payroll, you use it for the things I mentioned, okay? Uh, you, the rest of your EIDL will be considered and you will be given an SBA number, they will tell you to open up a portal and there'll be dialogue between you and the SBA eventually. It's, it's been a very methodical process, as you might imagine, because of the sheer numbers. So that's the idle. That's, think of it as working capital, but if you have to use it for 
payroll for yourself, then so be it. Um, let's talk about the PPP, Paycheck Protection Program. Most of you from the, the number of questions, uh, you clearly are familiar with it. Uh, this new, I call PPP2, the sequel, the newer appropriations, that was $310 billion with a B. So right now they're looking at about a hundred billion left. The, the expenditure of those funds has been a lot slower than PPP1. Many of you read the papers, you've heard, there were a lot of big loans went to big companies and clearly uh, this new PPP2 version has been shaped and, and directed more closely towards helping smaller businesses i.e. many of the people on this, this uh, program right now. The average loan is around, I think, $79,000. So there's been a lot of smaller loans, and obviously uh, smaller people. Um, and she has so the, uh, the PPP is, is basically you, you, you apply for that through your lender. Any SBA certified lender, you can apply for the PPP. A number of questions on here have been, related to, you know, am I, am I too small? Uh, do I qualify? If you're self-employed, if you are a sole proprietor, you are eligible. Uh, so if you go, and I put this on the, the chat, I highly recommend you go to sba.gov backslash paycheck protection, one word. Click on that. There's a bunch of URLs you can click on. Questions for borrowers, questions for lenders, questions for everybody. I recommend you utilize that site and you can find a lot of great uh, answers to things like how do you compute what your loan amount might be? Hey, I'm just a little person. I'm just making this amount. How do I figure that out? Well, it, it, there's a very articulate, very precise way you can do that. And again, utilize the lender. The lenders will be interpreting the SBA guidelines. No two lenders might interpret exactly the same, but they have to stay within the guidelines. So I highly recommend if you're thinking about, do I apply for unemployment? Do I go for the PPP? If there's an economic need in you and your business, I highly recommend you pursue, at least investigate the PPP. There's a hundred billion left as of this afternoon. I don't know how much faster this will go. I, I can pretty much guarantee it'll be gone by this time next week. So please, when in doubt, at least go to that website. Also, I highly recommend, and I put this on the chat, you can get help sort of coming up with the right documents for the key thing for the PPP, and that is how do you get forgiveness? The PPP loan, if used correctly and documented precisely, it becomes, in essence, forgivable, which means you don't pay it back. The details of the PPP, if you're not forgiven for any of it, it's 1% over a two year period of time. There was a six month deferment. So if you take out a PPP, you have six months to pay it back. You also have eight weeks to utilize those funds properly. And if you look at the details, some of you know it, some of you maybe don't because you haven't really pursued it, but you must utilize the proceeds for the PPP program to pay your employees, if you're the only one, to pay yourself over eight weeks. So as soon as you get the loan within very soon you have to utilize that to pay your employees. It's designed, the PPP is designed to get people off of unemployment. So for those out there thinking, well, can I be on unemployment and the PPP to stay in, in good standing and get forgiven for the PPP, you must use those funds to pay your wage. If you don't have a W-2, if you don't have a, uh, a, uh, a pay service at uh, uh, check service, then you just have to come up with some kind of system. You will show your lender to document exactly how you were paid for an eight week period of time during 2019 and you utilize uh, your, your tax data for that. And you basically make sure you understand what your lender wants for proof. And then you could get total forgiveness for that loan. I also would be remiss if I didn't say that uh, you have to ask for forgiveness. So at the end of the eight week period following your receipt of the PPP funding, there's gonna be an email or some kind of document you send to your lender to ask for forgiveness. So it doesn't happen automatically. 
Uh, there's no benefit to the bank or the lender to not pay you. By the way, you can get a PPP loan from non-banks. There are lenders that are certified by the SBA. Uh-oh, did we lose Robert? I see Gail and Divya moving. So I think that means we must have lost Robert. Gail, can you hear me? I can hear you. All right. And I see Nicole too. So um Yeah, I think we I think we unfortunately lost oh, Rob. All right. He was right at the question that everyone was asking about about if you get the PPP, if you've gotten unemployment in, uh, insurance or or pandemic unemployment assistance and you get the PPP how do you handle it? Nicole, can you, can you interpret what you think he was saying? I, I think, he, you know, I, um, hopefully he he'll might, come back in. He might come back in. All right, you're on mute though, Nicole. Got that. Okay, so I think, I think what I've been hearing about these two things is that essentially if you've gotten PPP, when you're doing your weekly certifications for PUA, which is PUA, you're going to have to reveal that you've gotten received some income for work um so because you're paying yourself so that's you know so i think essentially you're going to have to reveal it on your weekly certification uh, right, right. i think as long as you're revealing it or you're and if if there's if you feel uncomfortable about how to answer these questions i would definitely again document any issues that you're having if you if there's any way to do this by going and sending a secure message to the New York State Department of Labor through the New York State government ID. But I would be very careful about certifying. So if you've received more than a certain amount, and if that amount is supposed to cover certain weeks, even if it's weeks going back and you've already certified for those weeks, probably most PUA folks have not received that money yet. So I would absolutely go and let the Department of Labor know that you've done this so that you're not gonna be accused of any kind of impropriety. I think Bob um, just is back. to cover yourself. Yeah, Robert, we're just, people are in the chat and the Q&A just really drilling down on this question that you started to answer. If, if they've got unemployment insur uh, uh, insurance or PUA, and then they get the PPP, um, it sounds like, I mean, it, they can take the PPP, but then they have to pay themselves and they have to report what they paid themselves on their weekly certification to... Uh, State Department of Labor, and that might downward adjust their what they're getting in unemployment benefits if they're paying themselves through the PPP. Well, yeah, that, that's I'm, I'm not an expert on unemployment, so I don't want to give suggestions on take it and then worry about do you well later. That's not my intent. Uh, when you accept, when you apply for a PPP Paycheck Protection Loan, you're certifying. There's a number of questions they ask you, and they're asking you, is there an economic need? So some of you out there have a business uh, and you also are have an employment. So uh, th you have to basically reconcile that with Department of Labor. But for PPP, if, if you are you are basically certifying that you have the economic need, you are paying yourself, you're going to provide documentation to the lender that you have been paying yourself uh, and you have whatever documents you utilize that. You're also showing receipts for your utilities because, again, I, I got cut off, I think, right at the point. So at least 75% must go to payroll, your payroll in most cases in this, in this group. Uh, but 25% can be utilized for things like your utilities, uh, mortgage interest, uh, and rent. So make sure you have all those receipts and document. Some people recommend, and I'm, I'm a big fan of, when you get your proceeds, create a separate business account or a separate account in any case. So you can keep it straight and it's, it's quite easy to identify cash flow in and out of that account for the lender who's going to be asking for this. But I, I wanna make sure, I, as far as the two connecting, I, I'm, I'm unclear on how DOL is going to work. All right, let me ask one more question on this. This, you know, So let's say you get PUA, it starts coming, you think that because it's gonna keep flowing, it's maybe like a better bet for you than the PPP, which is a one-time thing. Can you, if you choose to return the PPP, can you do that without a penalty? Thank you, that's a great question. I think it was asked earlier too. Absolutely, the pre, there are no prepayment fees uh, for idle or uh, PPP. And one last thing I wanna mention real quick, if somebody comes out of the blue and offers to help you get a faster PPP for a small fee, that's up to you. There's no fees for these at all, for getting them or paying them back early. 
All right, that's great, thank you. Um, Nicole, I wanna ask you one more question that I think like five or six people have asked in these hundreds of questions, which is a bunch of people seem to have gotten two $600 PUA payments having applied but being very mystified by what they are and what they mean. Do you have any insight yes. into that? Um, well, I, I'm pretty sure that it's the PUC, which is this $600 add-on, and it's a good sign. Um, it's a good sign, and I think that basically the Department of Labor has been sending it out primarily to PUA applicants who they believe are probably eligible, so it's a good sign that you're eventually going to be approved. Um, and your application has been completed, but they haven't figured out how much PUA they're supposed to give you. So the PUA, that's the amount, that's that base rate, that $600 is gonna be a sure thing if you're, if you're eligible for PUA, but the amount, the regular amount could be anything from 182 to 504, and since they can't figure out what it's gonna be, they're probably, we hope, just sending out the $600 for those who they think are most likely eligible, but they haven't figured out what the rate is. So that's a good sign, keep certifying, it's hopeful. Um, if you're not getting it, if you're not getting any response at all, and it's been weeks, I would, that's when I would definitely reach out to your electeds, I'm sorry, <laughs> to your state electeds. No, no, we um, don't mind the outreach. <laughs> but, you know, that's all that I, it's the only way that I think people are able to get through. It's just terrible. They get through with the state people, believe you me, can't imagine how many contacts there are. Former staff people of elected officials, guess where they're working? So it works, believe me. All right, um, we now have our third presenter who I'm so, uh, we're so lucky to have, and we'll see if we can answer a few more of these questions and, and we'll follow up. We will be sending out all the information and all the links and all the presentations, uh, which I think there's a lot in, and, and we'll get to some additional questions if we can. But a lot of your questions have understandably been about rent issues, both personal, you know, obviously for freelancers, both personal rent, and if you have a sole proprietorship or a studio, uh, in some cases, commercial rent as well. Um, and, you know, here, there's less, say, like great state, pro even, a, I don't want to call the state program great, but UI and PUA and PPP exist for you to apply to. Um, uh, on the rent level, you know, as, as was mentioned earlier, the governor just deferred any potential eviction actions into August, but that is not the same as there being some kind of rent relief uh, program. But uh, tenant activists are really fighting hard on this and have been organizing. And you heard from some of them on the call last time, but we're lucky to have Divya Sundaram from Community Voices Heard, who's been helping to lead uh, a lot of that work. So Divya, thank you so much for joining us. Hey, thanks for having me. Sorry to join a little bit late. I was actually just getting off the call with some of our members talking about rent relief. So I'm like on a roll. I'm feeling energized. Um, you know, a lot of what we were discussing on our call with members just now is like what people are struggling with in this moment. We had folks on that call from, you know, across the five boroughs, from parts of the Hudson Valley, Westchester, Dutchess, Rockland counties. Uh, people who live in all kinds of housing, public housing residents, private tenants, yeah, small business owners who are paying commercial rents. And we had a, like a really important discussion of just like what's going on right now, but also about how people were struggling even before this pandemic hit. And so a lot of what the housing movement is really focused on now is the immediate relief that people need but also how are we using this moment to pave the way for long-term solutions and guaranteeing that everyone can have a safe, quality, and truly affordable home um, going out of this crisis. It's not just about short-term solutions, it's about long-term solutions as well. So at Community Voices Heard, we've been really excited and proud and energized to be part of not just statewide work, but also federal work pushing for rent relief. Um, there are a few different policies out there right now, uh, both at the state and national levels that are trying to do that, you know, trying to really get renters and tenants the support they need right now. Um, you know, there's rental assistance bills that are trying to um, provide renters with, um, who have lost income, lost their jobs with relief so they can keep paying rent. And then there's the bigger push for just canceling rent and mortgage payments 
completely and really taking stock of like what people are dealing with in this crisis, trying to ensure that people don't leave this crisis with a massive pile of debts, avoiding mass evictions and displacement, um, you know, seeing the number of unhoused people increase drastically. That's all of the things that we're trying to avoid. Um, so there are a few different things that we're doing in this moment. Um, Housing Justice for All, the statewide coalition, um, is really working hard to cancel rent in New York State. And we are trying to coordinate with uh, national levels to also cancel rent across the country. And we really saw the fruit of our organizing um, blossom and bloom last Friday on May 1st when thousands of people across the country who can't pay rent right now went on rent strike. Um, there's this really incredible map. If you go to WeStrikeTogether.org, you can see it. And it shows every single building that was on strike um, as of May 1st, and it spans back until March. And there were over 190,000 buildings on strike as of May 1st. And you look at that map, I looked at it and I started crying because it's just like, really shows like the power of the organizing in this moment and just how people who are struggling in this crisis aren't just sitting back and like, you know, not doing anything about it. They're coming together and collectively organizing and really trying to fight for the deeper structural change that we need. Um, so if this is just something that speaks to you in this moment, if you also see this map and start crying and like want to be a part of this, I would definitely love to talk to you more about that. You, I think staff is like dropping links in the chat now, so you should definitely check those out. Um, and I am happy to like share some resources over email that can um, help you figure out like if rent is something that your building is struggling with, how to start collectively organizing and seeing if like a rent strike is something you need to move towards and how to just provide support to people you're in your building and paving the way for long-term tenant unions even. Um, and the other thing that you can do is also we are encouraging people to call their congressional representatives and ask them to sign on to Ilhan Omar's cancel rent bill, uh, which will ensure rent and mortgage cancellations for people across the country. Uh, we really think this is the bill to be going after because it's the one that's universal, right? So it's going to ensure that people who are undocumented, public housing residents, um, all the people who are most vulnerable in this moment are not gonna be left out of the relief and the solutions. Um, and it's also working to, again, like pave the way for long-term solutions. One thing that we saw in 2008, right, was real estate giants and speculators buying up empty, vacant, foreclosed properties and just basically like corporate landlords buying up the country. And we're really trying to avoid that. So. One really cool thing about Ilhan Omar's bill is that it creates the opportunity for a public buyout and to buy land and put it in a public trust that would eventually turn into permanently affordable housing. Um, so it is really thinking about the long-term solutions that we need once we get out of this crisis. Um, I think I'm like rambling a little bit because I'm just so excited and like feeling the adrenaline of the member call that I just got off of. So I will leave it there. Um, but if there are any questions, I am happy to try to answer them. Well, Brad, I just want to also, you probably know this, but on calls today, we know that some members of the delegation in New York, and I'm sure across the country, are aiming for the $100 billion rental assistance federal bill. And it also includes state and local government dollars operational. And goodness knows we need that. So I think uh, every single aspect of rental needs to be on the table and if that's money i know it's never enough but that would be helpful right and i you know this speaks to the fact that in in the four care i mean the next cares bill at the federal level will be 4.0 but there's still have been four already because they called one 3.5 none of the four have provided any rent relief uh, or mortgage relief i mean they have provided you know the the pandemic unemployment assistance which you can use to pay your rent or your mortgage to supplement your income um, but there has not been yet any, any you know, rent, rent support or rent relief. Um, and it's worth saying on this call, we talked about this a lot last time, that obviously, you know, folks who are undocumented and even folks who are documented and married to someone undocumented are ineligible for essentially all of the federal support that we've talked about here. So, you know, you know we're, we're 
even with the resources that are provided, there's all these questions. But I think but, Divya, we really appreciate your flagging. And you know, there's a lot of artists in the Q and A and and in the chat talking not only about their anxiety about their own homes, but about the small arts venues. You know, that are so much of what our city is about. And obviously, we have enormous anxiety. Um, Robert, some questions about using the PPP and the idle to pay rent either for a, of the business location or if you're self-employed and you work from home uh, for your own home for you know the rent or the mortgage or those acceptable uses of the PPP for the 25% that's not payroll and for the idle. So yes, for rent, uh, if, if you have a, a location, as the rent is, is a good place, especially for idle. And of course the 25% is allowable to use other than paycheck. Uh, for the home, if you routinely have square footage that you're claiming for tax purposes as your office space, uh, that would be, again, that would be proper documentation from previous tax years to offer to your lender to prove that that is, is what you've been claiming for forgiveness. Um, Nicole, I don't know if you've been able to glance at the, the Q&A. There's about 200 questions there, many, so many of which are, you know, and a lot of them are just various versions of what you sort of said before. People waiting in different places. They were told they were eligible but haven't seen anything or, um, you know, just every kind of, like, question that it's hard to get good answers to. I'm trying to answer as many of them as I can. You know, um, I'm basically recommending calling state electeds. Um, uh, with it d does seem like somebody on the chat actually got a, a PUA, which is very exciting to me um, to see that. That's exciting and hopeful. Um, so that, that's a great and sign. Before we went live, you gave me a number of how many uh, people are are you know have pending applications, which was staggering. It's about 400,000, I think, at least. I think it's actually higher. And, and I, we, it's all different kinds of problems. It's folks who may have, I think part of the problem is, is that folks may have applied either with uh, not, either not the old application, the most newest, but one of the two in the middle. And those two in the middle, I think they, they should, be, folks may have, they may have caused a lot of problems for people. So if they can go on their New York State government ID and see if they can complete their application, I know a lot of folks can't, um, or can send a secure message, can set, check to see, because we're being told that New York State Department of Labor is going to be reaching out to the people who they haven't been able to reach through that system, hooray. Um, if it's true, I hope it's true, so check your messages. And again, if you're really not able to get through and you cannot certify it for benefits, please, I think the only way is to try to get through through your, your state elected. Yeah, I mean, they're calling, the state employees are calling 245,000 people. So they are calling, obviously. Sometimes people don't know what the number is, and so they don't pick up the phone. So it, there's so many different nuances to this. And we're going to send, you know, send the applic, you know, the information around. So I think a few of you have been like, can Nicole go back over one thing or another? But the presentation she had has a ton of information, including a lot of slides that uh, she wasn't able to spend time. There's also there's also a link to the newest application, and so people, it's it's not every screen that somebody would see because it's a dynamic application, but it's a lot of the screens to get you a sense of the kinds of questions that you'd be asked if you haven't yet applied. Um, and also, I did put on the chat, and I'll, I'll send it out as well, just how to reach us at New York uh, at, at Legal Services NYC, which is 917-661-4500, 917-661-4500 from 10 to 4, uh, Monday through Friday. But I want to be respectful of people's time, and I promised some answers on uh, the paid sick leave uh, for gig workers bill that I want to talk about for a minute. So let me just see. Uh, we've got this has been. We so appreciate your time, Nicole, Robert, and Divya. Any last uh, things you want to advise people? Um, Well, I mean, I just want to. I don't know if this going on. I do think that the call, you know, that this these presentations are phenomenal. Um, but uh, do utilize your state elected officials, and they don't mind. They're loving the attention. <laughs> really? <laughs> 
Um, all right, so yeah, so we'll circulate this and there's some, uh, you know, a good request from Claudia Vargas Decker in the chat that, uh, you know, that we should try to make this some version of this available in Spanish as well. And we can figure out if we can get things translated because obviously there are plenty of people uh, freelancing in, in all our other languages as well. So um, I'm gonna uh, stick around and talk about um, the paid sick leave bill, but uh, please just join me in giving a lot of gratitude to Nicole and Robert and Divya. We know you're like working like crazy right now and we're so <laughs> grateful for it. Um, and you're helping a lot of people get through uh, getting the benefits they need and Divya organizing people for change. So uh, thank you guys so much. Uh, we're here for you, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, okay, and if you if you didn't come to uh, find out a little more about Intro 1926 and paid sick leave and how that relates to freelancers, um, you don't have to stick around and hear me talk about it. But a few of you did kind of reach out on Twitter, and I promised that we would um, provide this information. So, um, so last month, uh, my office introduced a bill in the New York City Council that would expand New York City's paid sick and safe leave law to cover gig workers, that's intro 1926. And what it will do is expand, extend paid sick leave to Uber and Lyft drivers, DoorDash and Grubhub delivery workers, Amazon Flex drivers, nail salon technicians. Uh, there's home care attendants who are uh, made independent contractors, some day laborers. We estimate that there are about 140,000 low wage workers who are treated by those gig companies as independent contractors and therefore deny paid sick leave as well as other benefits and protections, but are really much more like employees. Uh, and this bill would require those companies to give them paid sick leave. It doesn't address all the other benefits, which are at the state level, but sick leave is a city thing that we can, that we can make them uh, make sure they provide. Now, we've heard from many of you, from genuine freelancers who are watching what happened in California under AB5 and are concerned about what the implications would be for you. So working together with a big coalition of freelance advocates and labor partners and workers' rights groups, we've developed some new language uh, that Steph is gonna put in the chat and you can see the, the bill amended draft um, uh, that really unequivocally exempts anybody who's working in professional services, um, including but not limited to writers, artists, photographers, journalists, performing artists, it's pretty exhaustive language. Now, the bill does still use this ABC test because that is the best way to make sure that the gig companies can't get out of their obligations. Um, but I think you'll see if you look, it makes very clear that it does not apply to genuine freelancers, independent contractors, sole proprietors, like most of the people on this call. Um, I guess I also wanna clarify, again, this is only for New York City paid sick leave. This doesn't affect how people are classified by the state for purposes of unemployment insurance or workers comp or healthcare or W-2. That would take changes at the state level. But we actually believe this language, which Freelancers Union helped give in, uh, information to, uh, Freelance Solidarity Project, National Writers Union, really gets the balance right. Because we have to find a way to get those 140,000 folks like the DoorDash folk who are delivering our food every night are obviously employees, but can't even take a paid sick day. So getting them covered, but not covering um, or, or questioning or raising questions about the status of so many of you who are genuine freelancers and sole proprietors. Now, we want to continue this conversation. It's already late tonight. So uh, we wanted you to hear, as I think you saw was so valuable from our presenters. So we're going to make two times next week to dig down with you who really, because we want to get this right. I think you know from the work on the Freelancers and Free Act and other work together. This is a community I care a lot about. So we're going to put it out there tonight. You can get in touch with Steph, who will put her contact information uh, in the chat as well. Um, and then I think next Thursday evening, we're gonna make some time for feedback. And then next Friday, I'm gonna drop into the Freelancers Union Instagram Live with Rafael Espinal and Caitlin Pierce. And we'll talk about this there as well. I, you know, From my point of view, having talked to a lot of you and also a lot of misclassified Uber drivers and nail salon techs, the, the kind of contingent work economy is really not working for a whole lot of people. And we really have things to do to make sure people can live whole, safe, comfortable, decent lives. That's gonna look different for different people. So um, the sick leave bill will only cover those misclassified gig workers, but we'd be excited to talk to you more about what other public policies would work for genuine freelancers 
Some of you have talked to us about trying to ban non-compete agreements so you don't get boxed out of working with other uh, hiring parties. Um, some of you have talked about some kind of portable benefits model. We're excited to continue that conversation. So we look forward to your feedback on the bill, uh, which you can do by email to Steph, and we'll be glad to talk about it at both, uh, both times next week. And I just promise that you know, we're not gonna move forward and pass a bill uh, without enough dialogue with you. So take a look at what's out there and we look forward to your feedback on it. Um, we will send out all the notes from this call and all the presentations. Um, and um, I just wanna say a big, big thanks uh, again to Nicole and Robert and Divya, to our wonderful Manhattan Borough President. And I have to say a great thank you also uh, to Steph Sokowski and Naomi Dan, who really are uh, working. I feel like on this call, we talked about all the people who are like both W-2 workers and uh, gig workers. And I feel like definitely the last few weeks, they've been working several jobs. So a um, few quick questions coming into the chat about the ABC test and the, and the legislation. Let me just say, take a look at what's in the, in the link that Steph just posted. Um, I think it's pretty self-explanatory, even if you're not like a reader of legislation, but we'll go into it in more detail uh, next Thursday night or, uh, or next Friday. Gail, any, any closing out uh, words? What, um, we're in a time of recovery in addition to trying to solve problems for those who need uh, money just to pay the rent and food. And so I think uh, the community, which is a very, thoughtful uh, community should also be thinking about recovery. And I know in Manhattan, we're actually gonna have a borough board meeting at the end of the month with all the community uh, discussions, uh, community boards, CECs, bids, and so on, elected officials to talk about it because there may be issues in addition to what you just mentioned that uh, a recovery could, uh, could be part of. I know the governor and the mayor both have a gazillion uh, committees but I'd love to hear from the freelancers and from the gig workers about what they think. As an example, the, the push to have open streets, I, I wrote the letter I think first and it's from the business community because they need to have the space to move the restaurants out so that they can in fact have business. So, and there may be tons of things that we can't think of that the gig, you know, how they operate during the day in a very different, uh, situation, what would work? What do they want to see? Do they, I mean, as an example, I want to see plazas and streets open for restaurants so that they can actually, and there you need Wi-Fi and you need the uh, things that wouldn't normally be necessary and what would work for this community. So that might be another topic that you want to bring up. I'm very focused on contact, uh, how we're going to be uh, thinking about it from a human perspective, contact tracing, and what it means from a uh, issue of uh, some kind of technology, what it is, and because many issues that are associated with it. We're doing a forum on that uh, coming up on May 12th with Columbia University. But anyway, what I'm trying to say is what does recovery look like that the community that loves you and that you love, what do they need? That's a, that's a great place to, to close us out here. You know, I think back to the, a lot of people have been looking at the New Deal programs and obviously that like WPA program that employed artists and, you know, poets and songwriters um, really helped the country survive. And some of that was about giving people income to make sure they could put food on the table and pay the rent. And some of that about was, was tapping into our resilient spirit um, and like obviously what we've been calling essential work rightly are the people in our uh, ERs and folks getting food on the on the table. But as we move to recovery, things that like lift our spirit and help us connect to each other and build the kind of networks and relationships that elevate our spirit. That's what so many of the folks on this call uh, are doing. So I think as we move to recovery, uh, that's really a good idea. I did see that. Um, the mayor did appoint Rafael Espinal, the new uh, president of Freelancers Union, to the, I think the biz, his business council. I agree, there's Gail, so many councils. It reminds me of like Game of Thrones or something. I think it was the labor, the labor council. The labor council. All right, but and that's good. I don't mean to. It's great that even if there's too many councils, but but I think Gail's point, you know, that we're going to keep doing what we can to get you like the bread and butter resources to survive this impossible time but that we really also want to hear your voices and have your creative ideas because we know the kind of work you do is 
um, is in so many ways essential to the survival of our city. It's what we makes us love it and want to be here, and we got to find ways to tap into that. So, thanks to all of you. Thanks, Gail. We'll send out the materials. Uh, good luck tonight, and uh, and stay safe. And thank you for joining us. Thank you.